All right, everybody, it's time for us to get started with our Bible class today. <clears throat> if you've not been in this Bible class lately, um, we have been going through the, the title of our study is Gospel Personages. In other words, people from the gospel accounts that interacted with Jesus and Today we're going to talk about James and John, the sons of thunder, uh, Jesus called them. So uh, we're going to talk about them, two, two very important individuals when it comes to scripture, uh, and when it comes to the spreading of the gospel, two, two very important men. Um, not that any of them were unimportant, but by the world standards they might have been. You know, looking at James and John as fishermen from Galilee, the world would have said, oh, what an unimportant couple of fellas. But uh, you and I know them to be very, very special people uh, from the gospel accounts. <clears throat> but before we get started, let's have a prayer together. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning very thankful for the opportunity to gather together with your church. We're thankful for the opportunity we have to open your word and study from it. And we're thankful for the examples of men like James and John that you have given to us, that we can learn from them, that we can learn from the mistakes they made, not to make those mistakes, and we can learn from their growth and the good things that they did, what we should do in growing in your service and in doing good for others. We pray that you'll be with those that are unable to be with us today and help them to be back with us very soon. We pray that you'll be with this congregation and everybody in it 
and everything that's going on in their lives. We know that there are some people among us that are hurting. There are some among us that are sick. There are some among us that are grieving. There are some among us that are dealing with the stresses of life, and we pray that you'll comfort and strengthen and that you'll help your people to be a comfort and a strength to each other. We're thankful most of all for Jesus and all that he's done for us, and we pray that you'll help us to be more like him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to talk about James and John. Now, both of them are part of what we would call Jesus' inner circle. And by that, I mean not that they were any more special than any of the rest of the apostles, but there were times where James and John were included in the group of people with Jesus that other people were not. Uh, James and John and Peter and Andrew would often, the four of them, be with Jesus. And then there were times that it was just James, John, and Peter. And Andrew was not mentioned. I don't know where Andrew went at those times, but there are times like the Transfiguration that they are present for. There are times like Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane that they are a stone's throw away from him when he did that. And so they are very special. You can look at a couple of passages to look at. It's Mark chapter 5, verse 37. Matthew 17, 1, Mark 13, 3, and Mark 14, 33, you get four occasions there that they were present and others were not. <clears throat> now, a couple of years ago, I preached a sermon series on the apostles, and James and John were, of course, in that series, and so I have a lesson that I wrote on James and one that I wrote on John, so I'm looking at the notes for those as we go through our Bible class. So we'll talk specifically, um, really when we talk about James, we're going to be talking about the two of them together with the exception of one event. Can anybody tell me what the one thing is where James is mentioned that his brother is not? I'll give you a hint, it does not happen in the gospel accounts. I'll give you another hint. It happens in the book of Acts. Well, I was going to say uh, Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Does anybody know what happens in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2? We'll get there as we study. He's killed. He's killed. James is killed. That's the only time he's mentioned outside of his brother John, who evidently was the younger brother. But James was beheaded and killed. Now, you'll notice that as you read through Scripture, how many of the apostles' deaths are recorded? History records all, uh, you know, some story of all of them uh, that we can't verify as inspired. You know, it's not an inspired record. James is the only one mentioned in Scripture. So James' death is mentioned in Scripture. He was the first of the apostles outside of, well, Judas, of course, killed himself. But outside of Judas and James, none of the rest of them are recorded in Scripture. James was the first of the faithful apostles of Jesus to die. Who was the last to die? John. So when we talk about James and John, we're literally, as far as their deaths are concerned, talking about the first one and the last one. Now, did you have your hand raised, Brother Billy? Well, looking at Acts 12, then it says uh, in verse 2, then he killed James, the brother of John, the sword. Right. Well, he's mentioned. Well, jo John is mentioned there. You're right. Uh, <clears throat> but I meant... I meant John was not present when James, when that happened. But yeah, you're right. Even when, even in his death, he's mentioned as the brother of John. So poor, poor fella, he can't just, he's in his younger brother's shadow. Um, Andrew was the same way. Right. Right. That's, that's actually an interesting, uh, we're, we're getting there. But uh, just, to, just to go ahead and say, he killed Herod Agrippa I, killed James with a sword, had him beheaded, 
Everybody liked it. He said, I'm going to do that again. So he arrests Peter. And then um, that's a long story. But Herod Agrippa I is known to us for a different thing that happened to him where he accepted worship that didn't belong to him. You remember what happened to him? God let him be eat by worms uh, as a result of that. And so uh, he, he got his punishment. Right. He lied in agony for three days and then died uh, and was eaten by worms. So anyway, that was supposed to be at the end of the lesson, but it, it got on the front end of it, and that's okay. All right, now let's talk about James and John. First thing we're going to notice is where they kind of get their name, Sons of Thunder from, uh, or Boanerges. Uh, I think that's how you say that. I don't know. Uh, where they get that from is their zeal, their passion, right? And we're going to notice the first occasion where we kind of see that. Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 56. Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 56. <clears throat> Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 56. I'll read that for us. It says, And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. That's talking about Jesus. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village." James and John were very zealous in this particular account. What we have here happening is Jesus has decided it's time to go to Jerusalem and it's time for me to go and to die for the sins of mankind. But they start heading from Galilee to Jerusalem. They've got to go through what region of the world? Samaria. And Samaria is full of Samaritans, right? We've talked about where the Samaritans came from. And why the Jews didn't like them all that much. The Samaritans were the result of when the Jews were taken off into captivity. The people that remained in the land intermarried with the people of the land. The, the Canaanite peoples and the people that were brought in. And had this sort of mixed up group of people. Where they partially believed the Old Testament to be the word of God. But they only accepted those first five books of the Bible written by Moses. And they didn't accept that Jerusalem was the place to worship. They worshiped on Mount Gerizim and they were all mixed up, right? And the Jews and the Samaritans greatly disliked one another going all the way back to the time of, we've talked about recently, Ezra and Nehemiah and their uh, rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem and rebuilding of the temple. The Samaritans were enemies of God's people at that time and they didn't like each other for a long period of time. So when Jesus says, all right, well, it's time for us to head down to Jerusalem and they go through Samaria, how are the Samaritans going to receive Jews that are traveling through to go to Jerusalem for an important occasion like the Passover? Are they gonna wanna see them come through? No, no, they're not. Uh, you, you would think, well, they, they'd want to see people come through and, and rent a room at the inn and buy some food and things like that because of the money. But they hated each other so much that it says because his face was as if he was going to Jerusalem, the Samaritans said, no, we don't want you here. Yes, sir. Right. <clears throat> Right. 
Right. Right. Well, when Jesus would tell his apostles uh, to go into all the world, he says to preach in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So Samaria was always next in line to be taught the gospel after the Jews. And Jesus has already, uh, well, if you go back to John chapter 4, who did he talk to at a well in Samaria? The Samaritan woman or the woman at the well is what we call her. She doesn't have her name recorded for us. Jesus talked to her. Then he talked to uh, the entire city that she lived in and spent a great deal of time there and many people believed in him there. And then we're going to see also the book of Acts rolls around and the, the Christians leave Jerusalem because of persecution. Where's the first place we have recorded that they went? Right. 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 Absolutely. All right. So Jesus had always been kind to the Samaritans. He healed a Samaritan of leprosy in Luke chapter 17. Remember, there were 10 men who had leprosy. Jesus healed them all. One of them came back to say thank you. And that man was a Samaritan. Right. Uh, he accepted water from a Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4. Uh, <clears throat> John chapter 4, verse 35, he said, after that encounter, when he talked to the disciples, he said, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then come at the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already unto harvest. He was talking about the Samaritans and their need to receive the message when he said those words, he said, the fields are white unto harvest. Go out there and harvest is what he was telling them to do. It, it, it's time to teach these people. But the, the Jews just did not like them at that particular point in time. But Jesus stayed two days and evangelized the town of Samaritans in John chapter 4, verses 39 through 43. He also made a Samaritan the hero of one of his best known parables in Luke chapter 10. We call it the Good Samaritan. We say Good Samaritan and we don't even think about where that man came from. We use the term Good Samaritan as synonymous with somebody doing something kind for somebody. And Jesus did that in the face of people that absolutely hated Samaritans. Right? So Jesus uh, continuously uh, would go on to to do kind things for Samaritans. The last thing, of course, that he told his disciples to go to preach to the Samaritans in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, like we were saying, uh, to the Jews, uh, to uh, Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, James and John, what they did when they found out that these folks did not want to receive Jesus when they passed through Samaria, they were angry about it. Would you be angry about somebody mistreating Jesus? I, I would think so. Uh, we, we tend to be angry when people mistreat us. We tend to be especially angry when people mistreat people that we love and care about, even more so than when we are mistreated ourselves. And then on top of that, you add to the fact that they believe Jesus to be the Son of God, which He is, they're going to be incredibly infuriated, and they're already primed to dislike the Samaritans, right? So their response is, Jesus, let us call down fire from heaven to destroy these Samaritans. Now, if we don't understand the Old Testament, that wouldn't make a lot of sense to us. But who had already called down fire from heaven in that same region of the world generations before? Elijah, you can look at that in 2 Kings chapter 1, verses 2 through 17. That same area, Elijah had called down fire from heaven to destroy uh, people. Now, <clears throat> I think it's an interesting thing that when you look at the miracles of Elijah, Jesus did almost every single thing that Elijah did, but more so. You think about the times that uh, Elijah participated in being able to multiply food. Did Jesus multiply food? Absolutely he did. Uh, you think about when Elijah was able to raise a young man from death. Did Jesus do that? 
Yeah, and he did it to himself, right? So when you consider all the things that Elijah did that Jesus also did but did better, and then here's the one thing that Elijah did that Jesus says, I'm not doing that, right? I, this, this is the one thing that differs dramatically because Jesus did not call down fire from heaven. So here's the question. Why were James and John wrong? Why were James and John wrong for wanting to do what they were doing here? Were they and why were they if they were? Right. Right, absolutely. Jesus came to save, not to destroy. Luke chapter 9, verses 55 and 56. So they were misunderstanding Jesus' purpose in being there, which they continued to do, right? The, many people believed the Messiah was going to come and do what? Conquer by war, right? He was going to run Rome out of town. He was going to conquer the world by force. They were misunderstanding who Jesus was. And that led to misunderstanding how he would treat people. And Jesus wasn't coming to destroy those people. He was coming to save those people. Um, any other reason why they were wrong? Right. Now, is zeal a bad thing in and of itself? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, if you don't have a certain amount of zeal, you're kind of useless. Right? Why would Jesus want men with zeal? James and John were men with zeal. Peter, we can say for sure, was a man with zeal. Why would he want those men to serve him? Because you can take zeal and when properly applied, do some great things with it. But you've got to properly apply that zeal because a lot of people fly off at the handle with zeal. And it doesn't do anybody any good. But when you point zeal in the right direction, that's when things get done. Right? So they have a lot of zeal, but they're pointing it the wrong way. And here's the thing. They don't know what Jesus knows. Right? They, they're misunderstanding his purpose, but they also don't know what's going to happen in the future. In Samaria, in the future, a lot of things are going to happen. I want you to look at Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. It says, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. I think I put the wrong scripture reference there. I apologize for that. That's a good one though. But it didn't have anything to do with the Samaritans. All right, let's look at Acts chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. We'll look there. Acts chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. Acts chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. It says, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. So Philip goes down to Samaria, and he preaches the gospel, and what kind of response comes from that? Great joy. A lot of people respond to the gospel. A lot of people are baptized into Jesus Christ. A lot of people become Christians. Now what would have happened if those same people had been burned up with fire before they heard the gospel of Jesus Christ? They'd have missed out on that. Jesus knew what was going to happen in the future. 
And so if he would allowed them to call down fire from heaven, those people would have missed out on their salvation where Jesus knew that just a short time later they would receive it. Right? So they didn't know what Jesus knew. They were zealous. They had good intentions, I'm sure. But they were just missing the point. Um, and Jesus was trying to make that clear to them. Uh, and it eventually would get through their thick heads. Um, I'll just go ahead and say, when it comes to John, we know more about John from his writings than we do about the gospel accounts, but what do we call John? The apostle of... Well, he's an apostle of Christ, but we often call him the apostle of love, right? Because love is a word that is used, let's see, how many times? 80 times in his gospel account alone. But then on top of that, you read 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and what he's trying to tell the church in those books is love one another, love one another, love one another. 3rd John, he says, hey, here's a fellow that loves everybody. Here's a fellow that doesn't. Don't listen to the fellow that doesn't. Uh, When you read 3rd John, that's exactly what you get. All right, so moving on. Let's talk about another occasion for James and John. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 28. Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 28. Now, I will say this as we get into this. How often did Jesus' disciples argue about who the best one was? All the time. All the time is the answer to that. All the time they argued about it. And it wasn't just James and John. I'm sure Peter was in on it and Andrew might have been in on it. And, you know, Thomas and Judas and everybody else was probably in on that conversation. But they would often say, well, which one of us is the greatest? Well, James and John also had a mama that wanted to know the answer to that question. And that's what we see in Matthew chapter 20. Let's look at verses 20 through 28. It says, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on the right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and be baptized and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand um, and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they are great. They that are great exercise authority upon them, but it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give life, give his life a ransom for many. So James and John came to Jesus with their mama. It mentions her specifically, but then immediately says what James and John say in response to what Jesus said. So it's as if their mother came up to ask Jesus a question, and James and John are standing behind her like, you, go, go get him, Mama. Go, go ask for us. And she asked, can my sons, when you come into your kingdom, sit one on one side and one on the other side in your kingdom? Because you have your throne, James on one side, John on the other. Now she's thinking again that his throne's going to be where? On the earth. She's missing the point. Now Mark also records that James and John asked as well. Right. You know, but yeah, the, this recording has other. Right, right. Um, <clears throat> so Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. Can you 
be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? Can you, can, can you face what I'm facing is essentially what he's saying. And James and John say, we sure can. And they have no idea that Jesus is talking about his suffering. He, he's talking about the death that he would face. He, he's talking about those things that are going to lead to his throne, which, by the way, is on the right hand of who else's throne? The throne of God. So who's sitting on the left side of Jesus? God is. So they can't have that spot. right? But Jesus said, okay, well, you're going to face the things that I'm going to face. But I can't give you where your throne's going to be. God makes that decision. The Father makes the decision who's going to sit where. Right? And... Two thieves. Absolutely. Right. The, the, uh, he makes a good point there. That at the crucifixion, who's on either side of Jesus there? Two thieves. Right? So just James and John just said, I could go through what you're going through. So you just put their face on those two men hanging on either side of Jesus. And that's what they said they could do. Because they had no idea what they were saying. Now, Jesus uh, is going to have to deal with something here because how's everybody else going to respond to this conversation? They're mad, right? The rest of the disciples have just heard this interaction and they think, man, those fellows got a lot of gall to ask Jesus that. And they're angry with James and John, so Jesus has to deal with the whole crowd. And he says, listen, The Gentiles all get together and decide who's king over everybody else, right? Who, who's ruling over everyone else. That's, that's the kind of structure that they're looking for. But I'm going to tell you the structure of my kingdom. Here's what it is. If you want to be great, be a servant. That's it. If you want to be great, then be a servant. Because whoever's greatest in the kingdom of God is going to be the person that makes themselves the lowest. And whoever's the lowest in the kingdom of God is going to be the person that reaches up and tries to make themselves the greatest. So stop doing that is essentially what Jesus is telling them. Now, the interesting thing is only one of the gospel accounts records when Jesus washed the disciples' feet. You know which one that is? John. John chapter 13. So John has just been told, be a servant, don't reach to be honored and respected, reach to serve. And he's the only one of the gospel accounts that records when Jesus sat at that table with everybody else who should have gotten up and washed everybody's feet because they are all, of course, lower than Jesus, but nobody was willing to do that because that was the low person at the table that would get up and wash everybody else's feet John records in John chapter 13 that Jesus got up from that table and he went and he got a bowl and he went and got a towel and he went around and he washed the feet of his disciples and then stood up and said, you do what I just did. I left this as an example for you to serve one another. Right? Jesus taught that lesson. Did John remember it? You better believe he did. Right? After Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, it seems like the things that knocked around in John's head were these lessons right here. That it, it finally got through. And so when you read John's account, he's the, gospel, he's the apostle of love. When you read John's account, he's the one that's recording, you need to be humble, you need to be humble, you need to be humble, and you need to serve one another. He's the one that's doing that because, in part, he's the one that that had to be said to a lot, right? So I, I can tell you this. As a parent, you know what lessons I teach my kids more than anything else? The ones that my mama had to yell at me more than anything else. Uh, the things that I was taught growing up tend to be the things that, first of all, I feel like I've done way better at as an adult um, because my mama had to work hard to get those thoughts into my head. Well, it's the same way with John and his following of Jesus. Jesus worked real hard to teach James and John that message. 
And that made John particularly qualified to share that message. Right? And Peter's the same way when it comes to Peter and his pro proclamation of the gospel. And Peter, when it comes to his writing of First and Second Peter, his growth through being taught by Jesus led to his ability to share the message of Jesus uh, and read, led to the credibility of it. So when Peter goes to teach the gospel to Gentiles, right, being someone who was prejudiced against the Gentiles, it makes a difference, right? When he goes to... Um, in the house of Cornelius and baptizes them and then goes and tells everybody else what's what. Uh, that's, that's just a testimony of his growth uh, and lends credibility to it. All right. And we talked about the departure of James when he died. Let's look at Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and we'll talk about that real quick. We'll read that together. It says, Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. All right, so that's what happened to James. Now with the rest of our time, however long that might be, we are going to talk about John from his writings particularly. I know that's not what your lesson in the book covered, but John and his writings... Um, is a testimony of his learning to be balanced. Um, <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I don't have very good balance physically. I fall down a lot. I'm clumsy. I get up on a ladder and I fear for my life. John and James, you could say very early on, weren't balanced spiritually, right? They, they, they had that zeal, but it had to be balanced out. Now, John in his writings is going to be very balanced. You're going to see, first of all, that he was balanced in love and truth. Now, you've got to have both love and truth, right? Love and truth are both uh, paramount to being a Christian. You have to have deep love for God, but you also have to balance that with the truth of God's Word. When it comes to worship, it should be an outpouring of love, but in the understanding of the Word of God. So Jesus would say, worship Him in spirit and in truth. Right? Now John uses the word truth in the book of John 25 times. That's 20 more times, and 20 more times in his epistles. So 45 times John uses the word truth in Scripture. Look at 3 John verse 4. Don't ask me what chapter. I think you'll figure it out. 3 John, verse 4. He says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. So John was concerned about truth and the truth and the sharing of the truth. But... And so because of that, John often wrote in terms that were flat out black and white. You know, we like to paint a pretty picture. John oftentimes would say, well, there's this, and then there's this over here. Uh, he often would do that. One particular example is 1 John chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. 1 John chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. <clears throat> He says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. So he said, You're of God, they're of the world. So black and white, right? One or the other, pick one. Now look at 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. He says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. He says, You love one another, love is of God, and if you love one another, then you're of God. But if you don't love one another, you're not of God. Right? So, either or. John likes to throw out those either or statements in his writing. 
And then 1 John chapter 3 and verse 6 is another one. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Right? So if you abide in him, you're not, you don't keep on sinning. But if you keep on sinning, then you must not know him at all. Right? So it's an either or opposite end of the spectrum statement. Right? Now let's look at 2 John chapter 1. Verses 9 through 11. Second John 1, 9 through 11. It says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any of you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, Neither bid him God speed, for he that biddeth him God speed is partaker in his evil deeds. So it's abiding in the doctrine of Christ, not abiding in the doctrine of Christ. All right, now look at 3 John 11. 3 John 11. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that loveth good is of God. But he that doeth evil hath not seen God. So he that does good is of God. He that does evil is, hath not seen God. So it's another either or far end of the spectrum uh, statement by John. So truth is pretty evident in John's writing. It's black and white. This is the truth. This isn't the truth. This is the way. This is not the way. But love is also evident in John's writings. We said earlier, he says the word love 80 times in his gospel account alone. That's not counting the times in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He taught that God is love, that God loved his own son, that God loved the world, that God is loved by Christ, that Christ loved his disciples, that Christ's disciples loved him, that all men should love Christ, that we should love one another, and that love fulfills the law. That's a lot of love, right? He, he covers the spectrum of love. <clears throat> now, younger John's zeal might have lacked love a little bit, right? When he wants to call down fire from heaven, maybe he's missing that love part a little bit. When he's wanting to destroy people that won't accept Jesus. Well, that's not the way. And so he learns love over time. Now, many... Um, well, let's just say this. Truth is never to be abandoned in the name of love. And love isn't to be abandoned in the name of truth. Either one. A lot of people have the truth, but they're mean about it. And a lot of people love other people, but they're wishy-washy with the truth because of it. You can't have either one of those, right? You've got to have a balance between the two. Love people and tell them the truth. Tell them the truth even when it makes them angry because you love them. Tell them the truth to save them from damnation because you love them. But don't do it in a way that doesn't let them know that you love them. Do, do both. Love and have the truth. Now another way that he shows balance is between ambition and humility. We said already that zeal can be a bad thing, but zeal can be a good thing. Right? John and James had zeal. And Jesus would turn that zeal into a truly wonderful thing. But on the, top, on the other side of it, yeah, they want their throne next to Jesus' throne. No, you're not going to have that. Because the other side of it is that Jesus taught them humility. Right? John's writings uh, often record uh, the message of being humble. Now, Jesus taught that to James and John and the other disciples many times. Mark chapter 9, verse 35 says, And he sat down and called the twelve and saith unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. That verse used to get on my nerves when I was a kid because when we'd play baseball, my dad was my coach. And if you asked to hit first, guess what? You went last. And he would say that every time. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. And I'd be like, mm. Mad at him about that. I still have flashbacks. No. <laughs> Look at Mark chapter 10, verses 42 through 45. It says, But Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, 
Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you, but whosoever is, will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So Jesus taught them that lesson over and over and over again. And humility is seen in John's writings because of it. He, he never mentions his own name in the gospel accounts at all. Did you know that? In the book of John, John never says, hey, John did this. How does he refer to himself? The disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, I in particular think in John chapter 1 where it says Andrew and another disciple were walking. That other disciple was probably John because he left himself out. But he would often say the disciple whom Jesus loved. The disciple whom Jesus loved. And then at the end of the book he says, and that's the same one that wrote this book. Uh, right after he talks about him beside the Sea of Galilee speaking with Peter and Jesus there. Now his gospel account is the one, the only one which records Jesus washing the apostles' feet, which I mentioned earlier. His epistles um, contain such terms as little children and beloved. First John chapter 3 and verse 2 is one instance. He, when he's writing, he'll say now, little children, and then he'll say something. And then he'll say beloved, and then he'll say something. So he's indicating the whole time he's writing, hey, I love you. Let me tell you something. Hey, I love you. Let me tell you something. When you proceed, whatever you're going to tell somebody with, I love you, it's a whole lot easier to get across. It's a whole lot easier to be listened to when it's coming from a place of love. First John chapter 3 and verse 2, uh, he said, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9, which John also wrote, he says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So he starts his letter with, hey, I'm John and I'm your brother and I'm your companion in labor. We're, we're in this together. And then he starts that letter that he wrote uh, that is so important to us today. And then finally, let's talk about his balance between suffering and glory. Uh, in his early years, he had a thirst for glory uh, and aversion to suffering. He didn't like that too much. But he would go on to be the one disciple present at the crucifixion of Jesus. The one and only, because Peter, what did he do after he denied Jesus the third time? He ran away. He ran off. So John's the only one there. Jesus gives him a particularly important role of taking care of Mary. It's wonderful. All the disciples except for John died a martyr's death. Uh, from what history tells us now, does that mean that John didn't suffer? No. First of all, losing all your friends is suffering. Period. But on top of that, he was, he was severely punished by leaders for serving Jesus on numerous occasions. I, I think um, <clears throat> certain accounts say he was dipped in boiling acid. He was uh, banished to the Isle of Patmos. We know that for sure. Uh, and he lived out his days there as far as we know. Emperor Domitian banished him to Patmos, a small island in the Aegean Sea where he lived in a cave. Uh, neither his epistles nor revelation record any complaining. Zero complaints. John never says, hey, things are bad for me here. Never. Even though he wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and Revelation, as far as we know, from the Isle of Patmos being stuck all by himself, he didn't complain about it. He just served the Lord and did what he was supposed to do. And so James and John turned out to be pretty great guys uh, through the tutelage of Jesus, I would say. That's all I got. Any questions, comments, conundrums? Mad at me about anything? All right, if not, thank y'all for your attention.
the Lord is in his home. Good morning. It's good to see each and every one of you here with us. And if you are visiting with us, you are our honored guest. And we do ask that you please fill out a red visitor's card so we may have a record of your attendance. And we'd also like to have an opportunity when service is over to meet and greet you. So please uh, stay around for a few minutes afterwards as well. So um, our song leading will be continued by Josh. Our uh, opening prayer will be done by Rick Shockey. Russell Tarpley will be doing our closing prayer. Robbie Johnson is going to be doing our scripture reading this morning. Uh, we just have a few announcements. As we mentioned uh, the other day, Mary Beth Carr's step-grandfather, Gene Kennedy, passed away this past Tuesday. There will be a great side service conducted on Thursday the 27th. Uh, so please keep them in your prayers. We want to continue to pray for Larry Carlisle and his family. Larry's still being treated at Kennestone. They need strength and healing for a full recovery. So we want to be with that family, and especially Haley and Marcus as well. Let's not forget about the children. Um, Charles Little was scheduled to be moved Thursday evening to the Marietta Center for Nursing and Rehab. Um, Mike Satterfield, who is here, so good to see you. Um, scans came back good. He will have an echocardiogram on the 25th, so let's keep Mike and Donna in our prayers. Uh, Sharon McAllister's younger sister, Mary West, had a stroke Wednesday morning and surgery that afternoon. She is in a medically induced coma for a few days. She's going to need a lot of prayers to pull out of this. So let's keep uh, Mary and her family in your prayers as well as Cheryl. Um, got a note that John and Katie Schultz's niece, Adeline, who's six months old, is um, having some very serious illnesses right now and she's being transferred over to CHOA today. So let's keep that little that little baby girl in our prayers. Um, Rain Tree Village Mother's Day Appeal. The annual Rain Mother's Day Appeal contribution will be on the May 14th. Please make your checks payable to Rain Tree Village. If you are giving cash, please see Rick for an envelope. Let's open our hearts to this great work. So that'll be on the 14th. Um, like I said, if you have cash, see Rick, get an envelope. If you don't find Rick, pl please come see me and I will work with Rick to make sure that that all gets accounted for. So just keep that in mind. Um, there is a new church directory. If you don't like the online version and you like the old school method of pictures on a piece of paper, you can get a binder. Um, I think we found our binder and it's funny to see everybody and how young they were um, from the binder that we had. Um, I think we got ours about 20 years ago and never updated any pages, so that's always fun. Um, but if you would like that instead of the, the online version, uh, please see Gary about that. Uh, and then graduation Sunday. Um, I do know that we do have some graduates coming up um, or who have graduated after the graduation ceremony last year. So if you graduated in the summer, the, the winter, um, or this coming spring, you know, please have your information. Um, we're going to be honoring the graduates on Sunday, May 21st. If your child or adult, child or adult grad, adult child graduates this year or graduated any time in the past year, like I said, and would like to be recognized, please let um, Beth know so that way we can put together a, a bulletin and some boxes together for these young children, or these young young adults who are moving on to the next facets of their lives. So. We'd like to honor them, so if you guys can get that in. I know she hasn't received anything as of today, so let's make sure that we uh, get those in there. If we have no other announcements, Barry's gonna come up here. Well, we have no other announcements. All right. We'll turn it back over to Brother Josh.
false start on the offense. Uh, 898, 898. We'll have this be our song before the prayer. Number 898. We'll sing the first and third verses. Unto thee, O For Chad, glad to see you today and welcome to the family. Also, we lost a very strong Christian, the congregation that I was before, whose name was Brian Wilson. Um, 89, he was a longtime elder, loved children, taught a lot of children, and he passed away. And so that congregation lost a, a great man. And I'll be praying for him as well. So let's all bow together and we'll begin in prayer. Almighty God and righteous Father, it's indeed a privilege for us to be here today in your presence to recognize you as the one and only true living God. We're in all of your magnitude and, and we're honored by your grace and your mercy toward us as we are your sheep and recognize you as the great shepherd. We're your children and recognize you as our father, our heavenly father. We ask your continued blessings upon each one of us and and your church is the world over. We ask your forgiveness for we know we are sinful and we're in constant need of your forgiveness. We also bow here this morning thanking you for so many things that you give us. For we know that all good and perfect works come from your bountiful hand. And we know that we are truly blessed as Christians. But we're so thankful to you for so many physical blessings that we all enjoy for our families and for our friends and for our homes, for our jobs, for our nation. But most importantly, dear God, we thank you so very, very much for the spiritual gifts that we have received for this congregation that meets here, for everyone that worships you. We thank you so much for this avenue of prayer that we can come before you and make our wishes known and ask you for continued health 
for continued forgiveness and for continued grace. We thank you for your word, that blueprint of how we should live. But most importantly, dear God, we thank you for your son who you gave to us that through his blood, we can have that hope of eternal life. We ask your blessings upon us today as we enter into this worship, as we lift up our song, our our voices in song and song and praise from our hearts to you to show you how much we appreciate what you have done and will continue to do. Be with us as we study your word and be with the speaker who presents that word to us and may we use it and apply it, study it. Thank you for the opportunity to gather around the table to honor that death of your son as we participate in the Lord's Supper by consuming that bread, that bread of life and that represented that body of Christ and the fruit of the vine that represented the blood. And finally, the ability that we have to give back to you. Dear God, in this prayer, we ask your blessings upon so many people. Larry Carlisle, Charles Little, Mary Beth Carr and the passing of her grandfather. Brittany Atkins' uncle and Cheryl McAllister's younger sister. We ask your blessings upon them as they struggle and come to grips with illnesses and death and comfort them, dear God, and comfort their families. Dear God, we're mindful of the Wilson family at Berrigville and the passing of a great elder and a great teacher. We ask your blessings and your comfort on Janet and Lisa and Kevin. And we thank you for his service and what he meant to that congregation. A special prayer today, dear God, on little Alan the young six-month daughter, six-month young lady who is struggling with health. And we all know how precious little children mean to you. We ask you to be with the doctors that are ministering to that young infant child. Put your arms around her and that family. And may the healing process begin. Dear God, we ask you to be with us now as we prepare to once again turn our attention to Rain Tree Village and everything that it stands for and all that we've done over the years to continue this great work and, and honor them in, in the great work that they continue to do. Each one of us look in our hearts and, and we were so blessed with the finances that you have given us that Helping this, this group is first on our minds and in our hearts as well. And finally, dear God, be with these graduates that we have as they t take on a new challenge in life, maybe going to college or into the workforce. May everything they learn here about you and your saving grace and your son May they continue to follow that pathway through life, continue to study their Bibles, continue to be the Christians that they were brought up to be. We wish them the best of luck and if there's anything that we can do to help them, may we reach out to them, comfort them, encourage them. We thank you for our new brother, Chad who is with us today and his desire to learn more about you, to be baptized and to become a Christian and join the rest of us in our walk of life. May we all encourage him. Maybe he be encouragement to us as well. 
Now, as we go into our service, dear God, may each one of us open our hearts and our minds to the word that's presented to us, and may we apply it through our daily walks of life. We ask for forgiveness, dear God, and we ask you to accept our worship today and our prayer. And this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Number 835. 835. This was going to be the song before the prayer, but then I forgot that part. 835. Let's all stand together. 835. If you're able to, let's stand. We'll sing just the first verse of this one. You may be seated. I was a little worried about leading that one because I'd never led it before, and now you know why. But I like it. Let's prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper this morning. Let's sing number 950. Number 950. We'll sing all three verses of this song. <clears throat> number 950. Your own.
receive your emblems for the Lord's Supper when you came in. If you did not, please raise your hand and someone will bring it to you. Now, as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he tasted it, he would not drink. And then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over there, and they put up over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroyed the temple and built it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. And even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for the many blessings you've given us. We're thankful for your son. We're thankful for your love, your mercy, your grace. Father, we're thankful for your willingness to go to the cross for each one of us. Father, we're thankful for all that you endured on our behalf. We're thankful, Father, that you gave up your life so that we, we may have one. We pray, Father, as we partake of this emblem which represents your body, that we do so in a well and pleasing manner to thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. continue our prayer. Father, once again we come to you thanking you. Thanking you for the love that you have for each one of us. Thankful, Father, for the blood that was shed on our behalf. We're thankful, Father, that you were the perfect example for each one of us. Once again, Father, we thank you for giving your life so that we may have it. We pray, Father, that as we partake of this emblem which represents the blood that was shed, that we do so in a well and pleasing manner to thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. song before the contribution will be number 843. 843. We'll sing the first and third verses of As the Deer. As
The Lord's Supper now being complete, we now take this time to observe another commandment, and that is to give as we've been prospered. Would you pray with me, please? Father in heaven, we come to you today so thankful. Thankful for your son. Thankful for all that you do for us each and every day. We're thankful, Father, for the measure of health that you've given, given each one of us. We're thankful, Father, for the many blessings on this earth that you've given us. We're thankful, Father, for our families, for our jobs. We're thankful, Father, for the ability to support our family. We're thankful, Father, for this church and the many good works that's being done here. We're thankful for the opportunity that we have to support those good works. We would ask, Father, that you be with those who oversee these funds, that they would spend them in a manner that would bring glory to your kingdom. We would ask, Father, that you would be with each one of us that we give, that we give with a cheerful heart. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you would, mark in your songbooks number 760. Number 760 will be the song of invitation following the sermon this morning. 760. After you found 760, just flip the page over to 757. 757. And if you are able, would you stand please? We're going to stand for this song and remain standing for our scripture reading. Number 757. <clears throat>
Good morning. Our scripture reading will come out of 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13. In the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must, keep, they must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in, every, in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and, in, and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Jesus Christ. You may be seated. Uh, Church, our elders uh, this morning have asked me to address uh, the congregation and to present to the congregation the church's need for deacons. And they've also asked me to uh, precisely uh, show how God's word instructs us in this particular manner uh, of what deacons are and how they are to be appointed and things of that nature. And so I, I ask you to soberly consider this with me this morning as we give glory and honor to God, as we open up God's word at this time and to see what he wants us to know. So, we need to begin with a little history lesson as we get geared up. I pray that you are in the mood for a history lesson. Let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter 6. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 7. Acts 6, 1 through 7. We're going to read about an early moment in the history of the early church. And when we talk about the early church, oftentimes we do so with very idolistic, nostalgic Um, words, and rightfully so, because the early church was truly wonderful for so many reasons. But we have to keep in mind that the early church had its problems as well. The early church faced adversity. Uh, And so early on, the first adversity that the early church faced was the arrest of Peter and John. Uh, Secondly, it was the tragedy of Ananias and Sapphira. They were put to death because they lied to the Holy Spirit. And then later in chapter 5 of Acts, we read about the arrest of all of the apostles. And we might think that these, uh, these adversities would have brought forth hard times on the church and it would have caused the church to, to stop growing. But in fact, the opposite was true. Because the church was faithful uh, and because great fear came over the church, Uh, And because the church was bold in its preaching, its teaching about Jesus Christ, the church grew. God blessed the church. But we just need to keep in mind that, yes, they faced hard times, just as we do. But their biggest problem, I believe, did not come along until Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, is truly a, uh, it's a tough spot. And the reason why I say it's, it was a big problem is because of, well, This particular issue had the greatest potential of threatening the unity of the church more than any of the others did. Because of this particular issue that we're going to read about, the church was, it was in a tough spot. It could have gone badly very quickly. You see, it tends to be the case that churches do not split from the outside, they split from the inside. And this is an internal issue that we're reading about here in Acts chapter 6. And uh, I want us to to see it as we uh, read through it together. Let's go to verse 1. Here's the problem. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Now, I want want you to notice the problem here. We have two different classifications of people. They're all Christians, but there's two classifications. You have the Hebrew Christians, and then you have the Grecian Christians, or the Hellenist. The word Hellenist there means that these are Christians who had a Grecian background. This is somewhat of a racial thing, but more so than that, it's a cultural thing. 
The problem is that there are some Hellenist widows who are being neglected in the church's benevolence program. And that's a big deal for two reasons. Number one, it's a practical uh, problem. Uh, It's not good that anyone in the church suffers need. And so that's a problem. But it's also a problem because the unity of the church in this moment is in danger. It's in danger. And that's certainly not good either. And so how are the apostles going to fix the problem? How are they going to reconcile this uh, under the Holy Spirit's guidance? Well, notice the proposal, picking up at verse 2. The 12 we read in verse 2, that is the 12 apostles, they summoned the full number of the disciples. They said, all right, church, let's have a meeting. We need everyone present. And they said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. And that phrase, serve tables, there is really interesting. The Greek word there is uh, diakoneo. uh, And it's a form of diakonos. And I'll say more about that momentarily. But they say essentially here that there's some things in the church that are more important than others. And the most important thing in the church is the preaching of the word of God. That takes preeminence. And the apostles are saying here that if we dedicate our resources, if we dedicate our focus, our attention to this particular issue, it's going to take away from the preaching of the word of God. Uh, And so in verse three, here is what they propose. And there again, they're proposing this to the whole church. They say to the church, therefore brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute or of good reputation. These men need to be full of the Spirit. You'll notice the word Spirit there is capitalized. Full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. And in verse 3, they continue on by saying, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Now, I'll just stop right here and just make a personal comment here, okay? I've read this passage a good many times in my life, and uh, it's surprising. This is very surprising to me because what I would suspect, if I was in this moment, I would suspect the apostle to say something like this. We're the apostles. If there's anyone here who is qualified to select these men, it's us, but that's not what they do. They say, church, you select the men. Here's the criteria that you need to look for. They need to be men of good reputation. They need to be men who are full of the Holy Spirit. And they need to be men who are full of wisdom. We give you this criteria under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. You tell us who that is and we will appoint them. We will appoint them and then we will continue to devote ourselves to the ministry, to prayer, We will keep doing what God has called us to do. And so that's that's the plan. That's the strategy for how this particular problem is going to be addressed. So after the selection of men occurs and after the appointment happens, then those men, those men that the church selects, those men are going to serve those tables. They are going to do the work of serving. They are going to make sure that those Grecian Hellenist widows are not being neglected. So let's see the result of this, picking up at verse 5. We see that this is precisely what happens. The Bible says, and what they said pleased the whole gathering. Okay? Which that's kind of an amazing thing, that everybody in the church can agree about something. Uh, It pleased the whole gathering, and they chose, the church chose, that is, they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Verse 6, these they set 
That is, the church set these men before the apostles, and they prayed, and they, the apostles, laid their hands on them. This was uh, likely to show uh, ordainment among the church to say that these men are approved to perform this particular ta task in the context of the church. And notice the outcome in verse 7. We read that the word of God continued to increase and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. And so do you see how this works? We have a problem. The leaders of the church come together and say, we're going to come up with a plan as to how this problem will be addressed. We're going to do so under the, the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And this particular problem was solved by the apostle saying to the church, we want you to pick out men. Here's what you need to look for. The church does that. They present these men to the leaders of the church, the apostles in this case, and they are appointed for this service. And this story uh, of, of growing pains, really, this story of growing pains in the early church is a great demonstration of the need for the church to identify problems when they arise. Uh, it demonstrates the need for the leaders of the church to confer with one another and come up with a plan as to how problems ought to be addressed. And it also is a demonstration of the leaders of the church empowering their member, the members of the church for service, which is really what we're all called to do. We're all called to serve. And again, we don't have the same function, but the idea is to share in service. The idea is certainly not to have one or two or a few do everything. And so here is a great illustration, a great uh, a great instance of the early church coming together and solving a need. Sometimes it's not necessarily the case that there's a problem, but oftentimes church leadership gets together and says, okay, what can we do to prevent problems? We're going to be proactive and say, these are some things that we need, and these are some solutions that are biblical and will be uh, influential to help us fulfill the work that God is calling us to do. So Acts chapter 6 is a very interesting moment in the history of the early church. It's the apostles saying, we need help. And you know what? Every elder, uh, every shepherd, every minister, every church worker needs assistance because we're all members of the body of Christ and we all have to work together toward a common goal. But when it comes to who the deacons of the church are, I want us to consider that in the New Testament, the roles of elder and deacons, elders and deacons, they are linked together. They are associated together uh, in several passages. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1 is one such passage. Next slide, please. In that text, we read that um, at the beginning of Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, he mentions that there are overseers and there are deacons that are present in the church at Philippi. And in this particular case, in Philippians 1 and verse 1, the word for overseers here is episkopos, and it gives us the idea of uh, that these men have the responsibility of oversight. These men are the shepherds of the church. Uh, a synonym here would be the elders. They are the elders of the church. And the word for deacons here is diakonos. I, I talked about that word just a moment ago. And in the New Testament, that word diakonos, it comes up 29 times uh, in, in the Bible. And predominantly, the, the word diakonos means either servant or minister. And in a general sense, that is precisely what that word means. It means someone who is serving at the behest of a superior. Uh, and there's a sense that every follower of Jesus Christ is a diakonos. What I mean by that is every Christian is a servant. Uh, John 12 and verse 26 
is one passage that gives us this idea. Jesus in that passage says that if anyone serves me, if anyone diakoneo me, he must follow me. And where I am, Jesus says, there will my diakonos, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. We're all servants. We are all diakonoses uh, in the church. But in 1 Timothy, our scripture reading this morning, it is evident that Paul is not writing generally here about all Christians, because not all Christians can meet the qualifications of the things that Paul is mentioning in 1 Timothy chapter 3 when he gives us the qualifications for these deacons. He's writing about something very specific. He's writing about the diaconates of the church, the deacons. And the way that translators have chosen to render that passage is we're not even going to translate it. Because if we say that uh, he's making qualifications for servants or for ministers, it really doesn't convey the full picture. We don't really have a term for this. We're going to leave it alone. These are the deacons. That's what we read in 1 Timothy 3 and also Philippians 1 and verse 1. And ideally, every local congregation of the Lord's people will have a multiplicity of deacons. And the purpose for deacons is really several fold. I want to give you three purposes for the need for deacons in the church. And they are number one, support, number two, service, and number three, protection. I want you to think about how deacons support the church. Specifically, deacons support the elders primarily in the work that elders are called to do in shepherding the flock of God. I want you to think about the support that the seven men in Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 6, the support they gave to the apostles. Now that we have these men in place, the apostles can do what God is calling them to do. They're supporting them to do that needed work. Deacons do that in a local congregation. They support the leadership. They make ministry possible. They make it possible for the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God to take preeminence. If, if a church does not have deacons in place, that is going to suffer. The preaching and teaching of the Word of God will suffer. So that is one reason why de deacons are essential. The other reason is that deacons serve. What I mean by that is that deacons meet tangible needs. Think Acts 6 here. The Grecian widows were suffering. They were being neglected. We're going to appoint seven men to meet their needs. They're going to make sure that those widows have food. They're meeting a practical, real-life need, and deacons do that. Whether it be, hey, the grass needs to be cutting, or hey, this wall needs to be painted, or hey, we need a door-knocking effort and we need someone to organize that, or we need a group of people to come together uh, during the week and just pray for our members. Deacons meet tangible, real-life needs like that through their day-to-day -day service. And then protection is the last one. Deacons protect the church from disunity. Think about the situation in Acts chapter 6. That is a very dangerous situation that the church was in. You could have a finger pointing, you got blame going on here, you got complaints everywhere. We're going to put these men in place so that these sort of complaints do not come up. Deacons protect the unity of the church. And when there are deacons in place, and when these deacons are doing what they are called to be doing, then the church is protected from the devil. Not in every way, but in many, many ways. So deacons are so important. They are crucial to the health of a congregation. And so that brings us to this question, who may become a deacon? Who may serve as a deacon? Now, Acts chapter 6 is uh, one passage that we might refer to in answering this question. Uh, we might think that, you know, if, if we need someone to, uh, 
to be a deacon, well, we need to consider what they can do, okay? Well, here's someone uh, who's a real good handyman. Here's someone who's a real good handyman, and we need to make that person a deacon. Or this person is great in spreadsheets and finance. We need to make this person a deacon of benevolence. Or uh, we, need, we need someone to work with our youth. Uh, brother so-and-so is really good with kids. How about we make him the deacon of the youth? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that particular strategy. It's actually wise to match up people's strengths with areas of needs. But it's, a, it's important for us to keep in mind that when the apostles were saying, make sure you pick out men to serve, they were saying that they need to be full of the Holy Spirit. They, they have to be full of the Spirit. That is where we must begin in our search for leaders in the church. These are people who have to be led by the Holy Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit will bring us a good reputation in the sight of the church. And the Holy Spirit will certainly give us wisdom, right? So we must understand that deacons are first spiritual workers before they are physical workers. Now, in our scripture reading this morning, 1 Timothy chapter 3, picking up at verse 8, Paul gives an exhaustive list of certain qualifications that men must meet in order to serve in this particular capacity. And let's revisit that at this time. Deacons, likewise, we read in verse 8, must be dignified. Now, what this uh, suggest is that a deacon must be an honorable person. Uh, this is someone who conducts himself with maturity. A deacon is a mature person. He is noble. Uh, he has the church's respect. Uh, he has the, a good reputation among the church. It's very akin to Acts chapter 6. So that's a good place to start. But we continue on, the next qualification, actually we, we find a list of three negatives here. The first one is not double-tongued, not double-tongued. A double-tongued person is someone who's not honest in his dealings with others. He says literally two different things. The, the Greek word here is dialogos, literally, that's, that's the idea here. It says one thing to one group of people and one thing to another group of people. Deacons cannot be that way. They cannot be hypocrites. It is imperative that deacons are sincere and that they are men of integrity. The next prohibition is that they are not addicted to much wine. The point here is simple. Deacons cannot be drunks. Um, alcohol has the great potential to enslave anyone under its power, and Christians must be known for our service to King Jesus and not our service to a dangerous drink that impairs and incapacitates. The next prohibition is that deacons must not be greedy for dishonest gain. And again, we see the need for honesty and integrity in the lives of deacons. But also, contentment. Deacons must be content with the things that they have and not seek wealth from others, to not seek power from others, influence from others in dishonest ways. Deacons are humble servants. And if all they have in this life is their service to Jesus, that is enough. Verse 9, we next read that deacons must hold the mystery of a faith, of the faith, with a clear conscience. Now, I want to say a word of clarification on this particular qualification right here. This does not suggest that deacons are sinlessly perfect. I have met many Christian men who have struggled with this, a clear conscience. And the reason why so many Christian men struggle with this is because I believe that we are men of humility, men of integrity, and we are our own worst critics. Listen, church, we are the people of God. God is the one who qualifies us. 
And it is the case that we're going to struggle with a sense of worthiness in our Christian walk of life. But if, if this verse means that you got to be perfect, then no one ever could be qualified to be a deacon. Uh, and so we must understand that our trust and our assurance in our clear conscience is a gift from God. It is a gift from God. It is something that is made possible by the Lord Jesus. And when we are baptized, according to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, we make an appeal to God for a clean conscience. And as we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As we walk in the light, we can perpetually have a clear conscience, okay? So deacons, believe what the Bible says uh, about this particular verse. Yes, hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. What this means is be a sincere Christian. Be a sincere Christian. A deacon must be that. Verse 10 is interesting. Verse 10 is very interesting. Paul says, let them also be tested first, then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. So before deacons are allowed to serve in a public way, they must first be tested. What does this mean? What does this uh, suggest? Well, in his commentary, William Mounts suggests that this test is an examination, that it is a screening process involving the whole church that out of necessity requires a certain amount of time. And the idea here is that an examination of the applicant's character is in view. Mount suggests that, uh, that the whole church is a part of this process and that the overseers have a special responsibility falling upon them. And the way that many churches choose to do this is to inform the church of the intention of the elders to appoint men after they've been selected, of course, and that if they prove themselves blameless, at such and such date, this is when they will be appointed for the work of service. There is a lot of gray area here as to how this is done because the Bible just doesn't come right out and say this is how it needs to be done. So this does fall under the wisdom of the eldership. But first, they, yes, they, they must be tested. Finally, we arrive at the family qualifications. Picking up at verse 11, their wives... Their wives, likewise, must be dignified. So just as the deacon needs to be dignified, so too does his wife. This means that his wife needs to be an honorable person. Uh, she needs to be someone that is well-respected by the church. And as we keep reading the list of qualifications for the wife, it is evident that she herself must be a Christian. Not slanderers. Uh, again, this is said about the wives here. The wives of deacons cannot be people who speak evil about others. They cannot be the church gossips. Our deacons' wives cannot be that way. Uh, Sober-minded is the next qualification here. Deacons' wives need to be level-headed and not intoxicated with the things of this world. She also needs to be a servant of the Lord Jesus. She needs to be faithful in all things. Again, that doesn't mean that she's perfect. It means that she's a sincere, God-fearing woman who is faithful to her Lord Jesus Christ, faithful to her husband, faithful to her children, faithful at all that God requires of her. Verse 12, let deacons each be the husband of one wife. Uh, the point here is very simple. Uh, deacons ought to be men, right? They need to be men, and they need to be married. They need to be the husband of one wife. Paul is not against single men because he himself is a single man. Uh, for all we know, Timothy was single as well. But it's the case that what Paul is talking about here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, the, the idea here is that these are married men with children. We read that in the next verse, 
or in the next uh, line of the verse, managing their children and their own households well. The idea here and the reason for this is the very same as to uh, the reason Paul gave for elders back in verse 4 of 1 Timothy chapter 3 when he said, if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's hurt, for God's church? And so before someone leads in God's house, that person must show that he has the ability to lead in his own house. All right, so as we're studying all this this morning, some of you may be thinking, this seems like a lot of work. It seems like a lot of trouble. Why would anyone want to undergo all of this? Why would someone want to serve as a deacon? Why take on this responsibility? Why expose yourself to the risk of that examination that we read about, that test that we read about in verse 10? The reason why is verse 13. Verse 13 shows us, it is a reminder that when we do good, it is good. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. If I had to summarize that up in my own terms, I would say something like this. To be a deacon is a reward in and of itself. It is a rewarding experience when it's done well. When men are doing the work that they have been tasked to do, and they're doing that well, every time there is going to be good fruit that is produced. And that good fruit that is produced will be a personal blessing to those men. What an honor it is. And so, I say all of that to say this. Uh, Church, we are in a moment in time in which we need deacons. Now, the congregation has many needs at this time. And I imagine that if we were to make a list, that would be a pretty long list. But I imagine that the list that we come up would be similar to any other list that any other church would come up with. But off the top of my head, we need to tend to the sick. We need to provide for the poor. We need to comfort the grieving. We need to promote unity and fellowship within the church. We need to welcome newcomers into the church. We need to ensure that this is a clean space, that this is a welcoming space. We need to ensure this is a safe space. We need to do many things. We have many needs. And deacons can help the church fulfill these needs. Today is the beginning of a very important process in the history of this congregation. I want to tell you what the next steps are because we are making steps uh, to meet some of the needs that I have uh, laid out here. Let's get them on the screen. Next steps. Okay. Um, The first thing that we need to be doing is praying. So, church, can we do that this week? I want to encourage us to spend much time in prayer this week praying to God uh, about this particular issue we've discussed this morning. The next thing that we can do is attend. Specifically, join us next Sunday during the worship hour because the eldership is going to be addressing the church as to how things are going to proceed from here. So in keeping with the spirit of Acts chapter 6, Our elders are going to be asking for recommendations for men to serve in this particular capacity. Now that you know that, do with that what you will, but certainly be praying about that and be mindful of individuals who may serve in this particular capacity. Study is the next step. We need to be studying these scriptures that we've read today. We need to be considering Acts chapter 6, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1. Really give attention to the qualifications that uh, Paul lays out in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. There are a lot of questions that come up, and if you have questions, feel free to ask those questions. But study, study the scriptures. We want to do what the Bible says in every issue, and in this one too. 
The last one is just keep, pray some more. Uh, the most important thing that we can do right now, this week, is pray. Pray that Macklin Road will always have willing and able servants of God. Pray that God is going to raise up a new generation of leaders here in the church. And pray that we will be united as a congregation to do what is good and what is right. And with that said, let's pray right now. Our Father in heaven, we come to you this Lord's day, and we want to thank you for the gift that's today. Father, we pray that uh, you will raise up a new generation of, of deacons to serve here among us. We pray that we will be united in our efforts to do what the Bible says. Uh, Father, uh, we pray that Satan may not gain a foothold as we strive to do this good thing. Uh, Father, we also are praying at this time that you will encourage those who are already serving in this capacity. Be of comfort to them to let them know that we appreciate what they are doing and that they are supported in the work they do. Father, be with our elders as they prepare to uh, lead the church in this endeavor. Uh, give them wisdom to know what is best. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, and in his name we pray. Amen. By way of invitation this morning, let's uh, think about Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28. In this text, Jesus says that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus did not come so that other people could do the work of deacon to him. He came to deacon himself. He came to Denakaneo. And in doing such, he has given his life as a ransom for many. He's talking about the cross. Jesus has died an excruciating death so that we might live. He gave his life for ours. It is through his service to us that we might receive eternal life. Now, what are we to do about that? We need to respond to Jesus in the way that he has taught us to do it. In John chapter 3 and verse 16, Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We need to believe in the Lord Jesus. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, Jesus also said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe will be condemned. We must believe, we must be baptized, we must live for the Lord Jesus Christ. If there is anyone this Lord's day who desires to do that, will you come as we stand and sing? Who will follow Jesus standing through the
You may be seated. Before we close, first of all, our closing song will be number 855, the first verse of number 855. But before we close, I want to echo what Barry said about the work of a deacon being a great work and a work that is worthy of honor. But here's the thing that I've noticed. Deacons tend to do things that nobody notices they do. Uh, There's a whole lot of work that deacons do that nobody ever sees done. Now, me and Barry, when we do our job, we sometimes get a pat on the back that says, preacher, good job. Sometimes people are mad at us. You know, there's, there's two sides to everything. But deacons tend to do things that nobody ever sees done. But if it didn't get done, they sure would notice. Right. And so anybody who's ever served as a deacon among us, I know we have some who have served previously. I want to thank you for doing so. And anybody considering this work, if you want to talk to me or Barry about it or the elders or any of the deacons that we have, or I'm sure our former deacons would say the same thing, that if you want to talk to them about it, our ears are open. Now, with that being said, we have a special treat tonight. Michael Rowland, I don't know if y'all know this, but he's in school learning how to be a youth minister. And he's probably going to be a better one than I am. But he is going to preach for us tonight. He's been working hard in school. One of his assignments for school was to write a um, textual sermon, a topical sermon, and an expository sermon. And then to preach one of those at a local congregation and he said I'd like to do that here and so he's going to preach to us tonight so be back here tonight Uh, we're looking forward to that and thank you for singing along with me today this is the first time I've led singing in a long long time and my voice cracked a little bit but y'all kept me going and I appreciate it so we're going to sing one more song that we used to always sing every Sunday at my home congregation growing up number 855 God's family. We're part of the family that's been born again. Part of the family whose love knows no end. For Jesus has saved. Thankful for everyone who is here this morning for your presence. Uh, If you're visiting with us, we do honor you as our special guest. If you can stay a little after the service, we would like to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, For all of you joining us online, we appreciate you joining us. If you're visiting online, we hope you'll tune in again or come in person and visit us. Let's go to God in prayer as we close. Father in heaven, we are truly thankful that we could have been here this morning and that you gave us another day of life to be here and worship you. We pray that our worship has been pleasing, acceptable to you, that we have uplifted you and given you glory uh, in this time that we've spent 
uh, in worship to you. We pray that each one of us has been encouraged and, and edified by being here together with one another. Help us to have that zeal and dedication to you and not confine it to this building, but to take it into our every, everyday lives, everyone that we come in contact with. Uh, be with Michael Rowland as he is preparing for our lesson tonight and uh, give him that strength and boldness and courage he needs as he speaks to us. Bless all of us as we leave this place. Keep us safe. Bless all of our loved ones. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.